Welcome to this episode of Wealth Uncensored. Uh, today, we're doing a different format. We have a guest, uh, attorney David Lesperance, who's one of the world's leading international tax and immigration lawyers. David has been advising high net worth families for over three decades on integrated tax and residence, citizenship, and domicile strategies that mitigate tax and family law threats while maximizing mobility and lifestyle needs. Welcome. Welcome to the Wealth Uncensored podcast, straight talk about everything that impacts your wealth. In each episode, I share what I've learned through my own experience and two decades of helping high net worth clients structure their affairs to minimize taxes and protect their assets for the next generation. I'll also feature special guests who are experts in their own field, sharing their knowledge and experience to help you protect what's yours. I'm your host, Jimmy Sexton, Let's dive into today's show. Let's talk about your clients that are deciding to expatriate. What's triggering that decision? These ultra high net worth people or these more more average people? What's sort of the draw that's breaking the camel's back? And let's talk about you know, the tax implications of doing so. There's been a, a number of different groups. So like I said, I grew up in Windsor. So as I found in my own family, it's quite common to have an American in the woodpile. And for years, they, they never really either were aware of citizenship-based taxation or were aware that there was filing obligations. And then the U.S. brought in the qualified intermediary regime, which took some time to kind of get traction. And then there was the, the UBS and a variety of other scandals that brought in FATCA. And all of a sudden, bankers, well, actually, their compliance departments were coming back going, oh, we noticed that uh, David or Jimmy has a birthplace in Arlington, Virginia. Uh, we need this form called a W-9, and what's that all about and stuff. So the, the report withhold and remit started happening, and all of a sudden, Americans, because of the woodpile, which are some, sometimes called accidental Americans, all of a sudden discovered, well, that mutual fund that my Canadian financial advisor or my UK tax advisor talked about is something called a, I don't know, PFIs, PFIC, was that what he yeah. said? Oh. And and my little company that I've got in Canada or the UK or Australia that I own, all or most of it is, is something like that, control for corporation. Is that what the guy yeah. called it? And, and my, my bank account, which I've had all my, my life here in this country, well, that's offshore to the U.S. So, and so they discovered all these things and they discovered that it was really complicated. And a lot of foreign financial institutions said, well, you, American customer, have a lot more complications for us than the Aussie, Canadian, Kiwi, Brit who's standing in line behind you. So they kicked them out. And yeah. so we found the complication of life. Uh, for a lot of these clients, they gave up their U.S. citizenship. And they flooded kind of all of the appointments because you have to do this at the U.S. embassy or consulate abroad. And so they kind of blocked in. Now, on the high net worth side, traditionally, when I did my first expatriation in 1990, and for the first kind of decade, that was really estate tax driven. And that kind of came and went. We all remember the year when there was no estate tax and some spouses were vowing their husband or wife would never see the falling of the drop of the ball at on New Year's Eve um, and, and stuff. And so that's kind of gone. And then the the increase in, that I started getting clients, hedge fund managers who are more focused on things like, how do I get net close to gross by Q4 of next year? Different focus. And expatriation for a variety of tax reasons increased. We would occasionally get somebody who is doing it for philosophical reasons, but at the end of the day, it wouldn't now, for the expatriations, if we look at, they're either extremely high income earners or they're people where the unified credit, we're, we're looking at a husband and wife who are 27.4 now, 27.4 million. So these are clients who are, really would be classified as ultra high net worth. They're sitting there, they've either done Puerto Rico, that didn't work, and they're ready to go, or they're worried about the political situation and kind of where the United States is heading. They're worried about things like the taxation of unrealized capital gains. Uh, Senator Wyden last week is focusing on, on private placement life insurance, BPLI. So all the, whether it's GRATS or, or charitable or remainder trusts or donor directed fund, whatever those, what I'll call fire prevention tax planning, they're going to move the goalposts on those. So now I really want to kind of leave permanently. I'm not seeing too many like ultra, ultra high net worth people expatriating because the exit tax is just too high. They have a lot of unrealized gains. I agree with you. I'm seeing a lot of high income earners. But what I'm seeing a lot of is sort of 
let's say the wealthier accidental Americans that have another citizenship that really don't have any connection with the U.S. And now it's getting to the point where other foreign banks are like, okay, you can open a bank account, but you can't make any investments. You can't do any retirement savings. You can't do anything else. You can just have a bank account. And you know, that's just not really, you know, this is not really practicable, right? Like long term, because it's not, not, not really feasible. And then obviously the things that, that you said, even if you find a bank that'll work with you to make investments, you have to be so careful to not invest in a PFIC. So you don't wind up with that punitive taxation. You have to be so careful about, especially if you're a, a business person, right? Like you said, only a foreign corporation and all the you know, foreign partnerships and all the, these different things. And all of those things have a very high compliance. The forms that you have to file to report all of this stuff properly is really tremendous. And the penalties are absolutely draconian. And so I'm seeing a lot of people are doing it just to get away, not even so much for tax savings reasons, but just to avoid the compliance risk and the potential cost associated with spending an audit and having to prepare ridiculous forms every year. Yeah, no, absolutely. That That is definitely a factor. That, that we see there's the compliance cost and yeah. there's the compliance uncertainty. Okay, I've just paid a bunch of money to this accountant. I'm signing this. I'm not even beginning to believe I actually understand most of it because we're talking about some pretty arcane stuff. And I hope my accountant's right. And yeah. it's, you know that's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, another interesting factor that we've seen is the Moore case. This is yeah. the Supreme Court of the United States or the case in front of the Supreme Court of the United States where the verbal arguments were heard in December, got a lot of press as potentially a wealth tax. And basically, if we if we narrow down the question is, is it constitutional to tax unrealized capital gains? Well, I think it's unrealized profits because this was the, the Moore case, if I remember correctly, had to do with the payment of the repatriation exactly. tax, right? It's just tax, not capital gains. I'm sure much as, as I have, you followed this case closely. And one of the things that really bothers me about, you know, some of the comments by by the Supreme Court kind of indicated that they're more than likely to not going to side with the IRS, but not because that's what the law says, but because of the turmoil it would cause to the U.S. tax system, which it would, right? I mean, it would basically- Oh, absolutely. It would be guilty's done, so far enough is done. Potentially the PFIC taxation would be significantly different, but it's very disturbing that the Supreme Court is going to, or, or may reach a decision- based on sort of the practicalities of the tax system and the implications it would have rather than what the law actually says. Yeah, so if they say it's unconstitutional, you just said Section 877A, the expatriation exit tax is unconstitutional, sure. which is the biggest barrier for most people not 100%. to pull the trigger. It is constitutional. Then if you open the door to well, the wealth tax, billionaire tax, et cetera. 100%. So it's really funny because I think so. I be, think because the, the way media spun expatriation, right, is this big tax loophole for the ultra wealthy. But the reality of the situation is, you know, if you're Elon Musk, for example, your expatriation tax would be so high because most of your net worth is tied up in unrealized gains and in stocks in your various companies. You can't do it. And so the exit tax, the biggest barrier, as you said, to the ultra wealthy leaving. If the exit tax were to, were to be ruled unconstitutional through, through the Moore case, you might see some billionaires leaving. If you look at Elon Musk, I, I mean, I don't know what his current numbers are, but let's say he's worth uh, two hundred. <laughs> let's say he's worth two hundred billion, yeah. and I don't know what his cost basis are, but for you know, for laughs, let's say it's fifty billion. And so he's got one hundred and fifty unrealized capital gain. He's sitting in Texas. Hopefully he's slipped yeah. out of California appropriately. So he's looking at, you know, effectively 23.8%. And so, you know, on, on 150 million gains. So that's a that's a quarter of 150 million. That's a good chunk of change, which let's say he expatriated in Q1 of one year. He's defined his tax bill. He's got to pay that by Q, the end of Q1 of the next year. But if he's selling that much Tesla or whatever it is, yeah. or he's borrowing against it, in order to pay that tax, that's going to have a huge impact on the value of the of that share price. So in effect, sure. he's defined the tax, but in liquid getting enough liquidity in order to pay the tax. So if 877A is gone, then he's sitting there saying, why wouldn't I leave? Um, I've got For a sure. South African, I've got a Canadian passport. Uh, you know, and when you're talking about ultra high net worth, they could weigh down the money for you know citizenship by investment in various countries. We we can negotiate them. I mean, Cyprus 
program is closed. They may not have the patience for Malta. They may not have the family history for, you know, Ireland or Poland or, or Italy. With that kind of money, you can sit and negotiate with a, with a government and get an EU country citizenship. Oh, we can do sure. it. Not, I want to say all the time, but we're doing it fairly regularly. Yeah. And, um, you know, we just... What business transaction are you do? Can we leverage this to to get right. a citizenship? And for that type of client, again, having the fire insurance and the fire escape plan, because you never know which way the political winds are going to blow the wildfire. And now I have some old clients that now we're on the fence about expatriation, but now with um, Biden wanting to change the you know the expatriation tax rules again, essentially reverting them back to what they once were. People are, are speeding up the, the expatriation process to avoid this potentially damning change. What, what, you want to tell us a little bit about what, what Biden is planning on doing? Because I think most people are familiar with the exit tax regime. A lot of people don't understand what the rules used to be and the rules are that he wants to more or less go back to. We had kind of from the early 90s until 2008 with the Hard Act, we had something called the 10-year rule, which when you expatriated, they treated your U.S. source and U.S. situs property as if you were still a U.S. taxpayer. So, of course, all the planning was that you minimized or eliminated your U.S. source or U.S. situs. Yeah. Uh, we then went to the mark to market, which is our current exit deemed disposition tax yeah. in 2008. And now with the billionaire tax, they're fundamentally looking to change the current expatriation tax regime. And again, exit tax or the 2801 inheritance tax, those apply to everybody who are, who are co- what are called covered expatriates. Yeah. So there are people with more than 2 million in worldwide net worth, which is, of course, the people we're talking about, yeah. or people that have a, a, a certain average tax, I think it's 201 federal tax liability over the average over the last five years, or who are non-compliant, uh, can't certify their, their yeah. non-tax compliant for the, la- for the previous five years. And so these clients are sitting there and saying, okay, I've got the fire insurance. Let's look at the current version of the billionaire tax. So it says, okay, it applies to people 100 million or more. Okay, well, that's, traditionally it starts, all taxes start with what they define as the super rich and tend to to migrate right. down as to what that definition, <laughs> what that really issue of rich. But that what we're talking about now, which is a deemed disposition once and done, they're now looking at, okay, you're going to not only have the deemed disposition, but we're also going to give bring back the 10 year rule on your yeah. US source and US situs. Uh, so if you're a tech founder who, you know, expatriated your Eduardo Sovereign, but you've got US shares that you've got to lock up, you're going to get caught on that. You're going to still be taxed as a US person on that. You've also got a shortened substantial presence test. And you don't have the 8833 tax treaty or closer connections to rebut yeah. it. 30 days in the United States, boom, you're a U.S. person for tax purposes. So you've got the first, that's the second, where you also lose a deferral that you can have with 877A. You've got the shorter substantial business test. You've got the 10-year rule. By deferral, you mean deferment of, of the payment of the exit tax. Correct. And the last one is, that finally kind of kick you when you're completely down, is after the 10 years, they do a new another deemed disposition. So they want to capture all the capital Whoa. gain that occurred in the decade after you expatriated. So you can see a lot of clients are saying, well, 877A is, is nasty. And they, you know, SCOTUS decided uh, on more that we're going to uphold the lower court and yeah. say that this is constitutional. But gee, this is like super bad. You know, I've got a lot of clients who say, look, I'm going to prepare myself so that, you know, what happens if the Democrats hit the trifecta in November? They come in the new Congress in January, and I'm sitting there saying, well, how much can the progressives sell the moderate Democrats on on something like the billionaire tax? I anticipate if more, A, this summer, June, July, whenever they come out with a decision, say it's con- constitutional, we'll have a lot of clients we're working on now because it takes time to set up the fire insurance and fire escape plan who say, look, uh, depending on what happens in November, I may very well pull the trigger before January 20th and the new Congress is called. Fingers crossed that the Supreme Court uh, makes the right decision, but I'm not hopeful. Hope for the best, plan for the worst, as you always say. Exactly. What sort of your process for working with somebody to explore their different citizenship and residency options. Well, one of the things to, to understand is that you need to have a, an integrated, coordinated group of advisors. Yeah. So I don't, for example, I understand what you do. You know, yeah. we, we speak a, a common language, but I don't draft trusts. I don't do foundations. I don't advise on, you know, all those things. 
I certainly don't fill in, you know, whether those are 8854 or 8833 tax treaty positions or even FBARs. Uh, but I understand the importance of all that. So I would call myself like a, a tax savvy immigration advisor, or immigration savvy tax advisor. Yeah. So wherever, as as we've found with the clients we work with, they come to you or me and they say, OK, yeah. you need here's the other parts of the team and you need to have a, an integrated strategy and that the team comes up with and everybody knows when to do their part because. An immigration advisor who operates in isolation of the tax plan can be a real dangerous character. A hundred percent. Yeah. You need everybody on the team and, you know, the, the other way around. I have a general idea about what sort of citizenship and residency programs are out there, but I certainly don't know the, the nuances and all the advantages and disadvantages of each. And obviously it's constantly changing. And my expertise is, you know, international tax and trusts, foundations. And that's why, you know, you and I make such a good team when we work on these things together. And then we even need to bring in local tax advisors sometimes in the various oh, jurisdictions that are involved, right? So that, that all of this advice can be pooled and integrated, as you said, so, so the client can really understand what's going on. One of the other things I wanted to mention is it's not just tax. As I tell my clients, tax is a percentage of income. Yeah. Divorce is a percentage of capital. So mm -hmm. I have lots of clients who say, look, I'm going to go to the UK. It's got this wonderful remittance basis. Absolutely yeah. true. But- it's also the divorce capital of the world. And they're not too friendly to the wealthier spouse. No. And and they say, well, my wife and I are solid. And I said, well, yeah. I mean, I have nine-year-old twins, boy and a girl. And statistically, one of them is going to get divorced. Yeah. And uh, I bet on my daughter, she's already thinking the bad boys are cute. How do I protect? Think of the conversation in the future for yeah. her. Uh, honey, I know we're getting married in three weeks, but I really need you to go get independent legal advice on this uh, on this prenuptial agreement. Yeah. That's one conversation. Or is it easier to say, honey, I know it didn't work out and I'd love to give you half. It's that SOB father of mine that set it up in a trust when I was six years old. So I, you get half of nothing. Because I think that's one of the things that a lot of people don't realize. One, the prenup is such a uncomfortable conversation, especially people who are going to be newlyweds leading up to the wedding, they're planning their wedding, and then all of a sudden this whole romantic endeavor, it in comes the, the prenup. Whoever's usually the one who, who brings it up or urges the spouse to be to bring it up winds up kind of being the, the, the a-hole in the situation, so to speak. But that's something where if you have it in a trust or a foundation, just alleviates that, right? And it provides you more protection because, I mean, there's been several cases in the UK where they've just thrown the prenup out for various reasons. They talk about something called Rodmaker case, which is a, uh, it was a German couple that had a German prenuptial that moved in and, and it actually held up, but it's very, very strict. Yeah. And it's one of the good gifts that the decisions that clients make in this area will not just impact their lives, it'll impact their children and future generations. So that trust, not that the Les Brown family treasure chest is that big, but the trust that was set up will come in really handy so that those children will never have to have that conversation. Yeah. And, you know, that's something to give your children. And if that wasn't set up by your parents and you're getting into that age where you're thinking about marriage, that may be something that if you do that beforehand, not the week before the wedding, but it, the sooner you do that, just in case, because everybody who gets married thinks it's forever and half of us are wrong. would add that a lot of people don't think about if you have a properly structured trust or foundation, obviously this doesn't count for every jurisdiction, but it counts for a lot of them. What a lot of people don't realize is you own your wealth in your own name or kids inherit their, their wealth and they have it in their own name. Whatever jurisdiction that they move to, all the income generated by that wealth is going to be subject to tax. If there's wealth taxes where you live, that wealth is going to be subject to wealth tax. If there's inheritance or estate taxes in that country, if you die, there's going to be inheritance or, or estate tax. If it's in a trust or a foundation, for lack of a better term, you're somewhat unburdened by the wealth because it's not yours. It belongs to the trust or foundation. So obviously, some jurisdictions have rules around, right, where they kind of look through the trust or foundation. But in a lot of jurisdictions, especially if you're just a beneficiary and you're not the settler or the founder, and it was set up properly, you're only paying tax on distribution. You're not paying tax on all the income being generated within that trust or foundation. The discretionary trust or foundation, you're, just, you're probably not going to have the, any value of the trust allocated to you for wealth tax purposes. When you die, it's probably not going to be considered an asset subject to, to inheritance or, or estate taxes. In addition to sort of giving the asset protection gift to your children, you give them a lot of flexibility to move around the world unburdened by their wealth. 
it's understanding how residence is not just an immigration document that you present at a port of entry. It is also a tax residence. It's also what jurisdictions will will have jurisdiction or comity, not comedy, but drama, but comity, and take jurisdiction over things like family law. And so it's really understanding, again, that's a lot of the areas you're dealing with, tax efficiency, asset protection, uh, succession planning, I mean, different jurisdictions. You have forced airship rules, which is, of course, in a lot of civil law jurisdictions and under Sharia law. So there's a lot of considerations where residences and ship and domicile are important. And so I get or get rid of those, but I have to do those in sync with the planning that you and local advisors, depending on what jurisdiction they would have as the team is working on. If somebody was interested in getting in touch with you to discuss their residency, citizenship, domicile options, what would be the best way for them to get in touch with you? They can go to my website, which is Lesperance Associates, L-E-S-P-E-R-A-N-C-E, AssociatesPlural.com. Or they can look for me on LinkedIn, David Lesperance. Uh, all my contact details are there and reach out. And if you're a, a private client advisor and you want to kind of, kind of get into, but you don't deal in this area, you know, you and I deal with a lot of uh, high net worth families, family office people, private bankers to get a hold of either Jimmy or I to be able to kind of plug in and find out what your options are and your situation possibilities are. Thanks so much for your time today, David. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for joining me on Wealth Uncensored, where we help you minimize taxes and protect your wealth for the next generation. If you like our show, be sure to subscribe and leave a review. And if you have any questions or suggestions for future episodes, we'd love to hear from you. You can email us at info at esquiregroup.com. And don't forget to visit Esquire Group's website for more information on how we can help you secure your wealth. I'll be dropping knowledge again next week. Don't forget to join us.